You know what they say about rules? They're made to be broken. Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today I'm going to be responding to a question somebody asked me on the channel Facebook group. Yes, that exists, uh, even though I don't check it nearly as often as, as I should. Uh, but they asked me a very interesting question, which was how Cardassian ships work. They don't have the normal setup of most ships in Star Trek. Now, this is a question that actually I've been meaning to cover for quite a long time. You know, given that I managed to work out how Breen ships work, surely working out why Cardassian ships look so different would be easy. Well, it took me a while and, well, here we are. So, I'm here to talk about the Cardassian design aesthetic and why Cardassian ships look the way they are. But, you know, let's just go into the overall design language of Star Trek. As you know, Gene Roddenberry has his starship design rules. Ships must have a pair of nacelles. They must be separated from the main body of the ship. They must have a clear field of view forward. All these rules, which over time would be broken in various ways. A lot of designers, even Andrew Probert, though he wouldn't admit it, break the Gene Roddenberry design rules, some of them more willingly than others, and some of them more brazenly than others. However, it's worth saying that I think throughout most of it, maybe up until you get to Voyager and Enterprise, where you have a lot of CGI designs and suddenly things sort of go a little bit pear-shaped and we start moving towards, I suppose, a more generic sci-fi look uh, for Ships of the Week particularly, though saying that, Ships of the Week have never actually looked particularly Star Trek, you know, given that most of them are built off, like, the Merchantman, which is more a Star Wars ship than it is a Star Trek ship. And then, of course, you get to Disco, where, you know, it's just completely out the window. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. These rules allow us to understand even the most alien designs of Starship. That's the interesting thing about them is that they allow us to make sense. These aliens that we encounter in the world of Star Trek, they might operate under a slightly different logic, might put their nacelles in slightly different places, or they might be of different size and proportion relative to their ships, but they all have the same basic logic behind them, which is, of course, this whole the whole point of Star Trek is, you know, anyone can be reasoned with and anyone can understand anyone in the future. That is the ultimate goal, is that we, we can all understand one another, uh, even if we don't always agree. You know, and this works even when you break the rules. As long as you give regard to the rules, it seems that breaking them, you still do it in a way that you're bearing those design rules in mind, and so there is still a relationship back to the core design rules, and so you can still understand those designs. And that's where the Cardassians sit. So, I'm going to explain how their ships work and why they look quite so different to anyone else. The first thing to do is actually go into the history of Cardassian design. So, Cardassian ships weren't always these sort of winged ships with a long tail. They were previously actually twin nacelle ships like everyone else. You can see that in ships from the 23rd century and even the early half of the Zenkethi War. The Prakesh, Aldara, and Traeger are all twin nacelles, and this is an important detail. The tails, or claws, appear on Cardassian nacelles, and this is perhaps part of either serving as something of a rudder, a steering mechanism, or possibly as a form of heat sink. Now, during the course of the Zenkethi War, we'll see the Cardassians opt for monotail designs, with large wings in the form of the Ravenok, Rabol, and Gromol. And now some may argue that this is a transition to a design of warp wings. Personally, I don't much like the idea of warp wings, and we'll get to that in a minute. I think, in fact, what happened is that the warp engine was moved to the tail, and that instead of having two warp engines, they had only a single warp engine, which is largely a cost-saving exercise, particularly if you're in an attritional war with a much more powerful enemy. Then, post-war, we see a brief return to twin-engine designs in the form of the Bralek and the Kraxon. But then, after that, when we go to the Talarian War, we will see the modern Cardassian design aesthetic established and remain. So, this is where we really see monotail engines become the default 
for Cardassians. And you can see with the ships of the Telerian War, they much more heavily resemble modern Cardassian vessels. So my case is this. Cardassians did have dual nacelle designs like everyone else, but when they were engaged in large attritional wars, they found that it was not economical to keep building ships with two nacelles and instead move to mono nacelle designs. Now, if you're a hardcore Gene Roddenberry purist, you might say that mono nacelles are just wrong and we can't have that at all. Most people accept that mono nacelle designs are actually acceptable. So, in any case, they moved to mono nacelle designs as partially a cost saving measure. And this would make an awful lot of sense because we're going to observe a couple features that seem to be present on all these Cardassian designs. But before that, what I should do is actually explain why I don't think Cardassian ships have warp wings. Now, it is a tempting thought because you can see the bizarre ram scoops in the wings. Well, if you did have warp coils in the wings, they would be very oddly shaped. They take up they take up an awful lot of space and not generate the optimum amount of power. Whereas if you had your warp coil back in the tail, which has more depth, which is how you have warp coils and that's how they generate their power, it works a lot better and it would make a lot more sense. So what's going on with the wings? We'll get to that. But if you like the warp wing as an alternative, I think it does work reasonably well with the Cardassians. Just depends how thick or thin those wings are. Uh, the, the origin of the warp wing idea comes from the Klingon bird of prey and where are its nacelles. Now, personally, I think it has a essentially a mono nacelle design hybridized with an impulse engine in the back. But that's just me. And so, yeah, that warp wing idea only really works with bigger ships with thicker wings. When you go to smaller ships, it sort of falls apart. And even with ships like the Hideki, because that sort of wing or uh, curved section at the front is quite thin, you don't really see warp coils fitting in there, whereas you can see warp coils fitting into the tail. And so this is the idea. So you have these fins coming off the tail, these sort of claws. These clearly denote a propulsion system. They may be employed for steering or cooling. Certainly, the Rizel school of design for Cardassian ships definitely makes it seem like these are primarily cooling mechanisms, which does make an awful lot of sense. Cooling mechanisms are very important to ships in Star Trek and often are sort of neglected, especially by other sci-fi as well. But both of these would be important because... Well, if you have only a mono nacelle, it's very difficult to steer your ship, so you may need an additional system to help better maneuver at warp speed and steer at warp speed. A little bit like how early tanks of World War I had these sort of steering anchors which they towed behind them, which they eventually got shot off. Uh, and alternatively, they could be for cooling, which again makes sense if you're running a mono nacelle design and a mono nacelle that is embedded into the hull which means that it is very protected, but that also you aren't getting the benefits of radiating that heat away into empty space as you would when putting in a cell on a pylon. Additionally, if you look at the back of the galor, you will also see a kind of vent aperture or something, but the impulse engines are very clearly on the wings. So we do see similar kind of exhaust systems on the back of, say, the original Constitution, those sort of little balls on the back of the Enterprise's engines and I think that's what this corresponds to. And then finally you also have, and this is on the original Galor model as well as more you know recent renditions, you have a large grill section on the back. Now people have illustrated that as a sensor array. Why would you have a sensor array on the back of your ship? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Bearing in mind, of course, starships are built like jet fighters. They're designed like jet fighters. Jet fighters don't have the radar in the tail. They have their big radar up in the nose. So it doesn't really make sense as a sensor array. But it does make sense as effectively your warp field grill, as you would see on Federation ships. And these kinds of details are then further brought out by artists like Rizel 3 d who has done an amazing job in bringing Cardassian ships to life. I can't say it enough. Uh, and they are very, very prominent on all of her designs, which suggests that this is where the warp engines are. So the point being there that, you know, you can use this system to make sense of most Cardassian designs, uh, even then ships like the Hutet. 
So, okay, what's the point of the wings, I suppose? Moving on from that. Well, the wings allow greater deuterium harvesting and also mount the impulse engines, which allows certain benefits for maneuverability uh, and better steering at sublight speed. But also, it would serve to create what I'm going to call a warp slash impulse turbojet. So you have the ram scoops up front and they directly feed to the impulse engines. Impulse engines still need uh, deuterium for their fusion reactors to create plasma, which is ultimately what makes impulse engines work. Or they can that deuterium can be fed to the warp core and then that goes out to the main warp nacelle at the back. So why would you design a ship like this? Well, as I've mentioned before, one, the cell is fairly obviously cheaper than two. It's cheaper to run as well. It doesn't have the same fuel demands and it doesn't have the same maintenance. Again, you're halving your maintenance if you are building these nacelles to, with the understanding that, you know, they are going to be operating as just mono nacelles. It simplifies supply and logistics. You're also going to be better off at sublight. You're going to be prioritizing your sublight performance over your warp performance. And especially this would come in handy if you're engaged in very resistant mediums. Say if you're traveling through somewhere with a lot of gravimetric shear, like the Badlands, McAllister Nebula, and other areas of space where potentially there's actually a little bit of resistance, technically. That's where having more impulse power could come in very handy. It also, of course, harvests fuel better, which means you don't need to top up as often, which, again, greatly improves your logistical situation. And it is a very simple integrated system which can be produced at scale. That's the other advantage of this. You can produce this at scale. You're building the same thing over and over again. So what are the downsides of this? Well, it likely lacks endurance. You probably can't stay at warp for as long because you're effectively double loading a single nacelle. You're putting twice the load on a single nacelle as you would with a dual nacelle system. So you're going to suffer from heat buildup. That explains the big fins. And that explains why something like the Hutet has these gigantic tail fins. These are just there to support the warp engines and make sure that they don't overheat. Obviously, this does impede your warp speed mobility. You're not going to be particularly maneuverable when traveling at warp speed if you do this. You're going to be outmaneuvered by any dual nacelle design. But the Cardassians don't really care about that. The system also isn't very modular. You can't just take a eject a burnt out nacelle and replace it with a brand new one. You've got to basically start disassembling the entire ship. So it does mean that your long-term maintenance is probably a lot more difficult compared to those who have gone for dual nacelle designs. So just to sum things up, for the needs of the other major powers of the Alpha and Beta Quadrant, the Federation, the Klingons, the Romulans, this obviously wouldn't work for them. It, it, it's not a good deal for them. But for the Cardassians, who are technologically behind the other major powers, who have a smaller economy, this is probably what actually allowed them to punch above their weight and build two ships for the price of one. It explains an awful lot about how they're able to field such great numbers so quickly is because they have this much more simplified design of warship, the result of fighting multiple attritional wars over the previous century, which then gives them these very simple easy to produce designs they have their downsides by all means you know eventually you are going to have to maintain that ship and you when you do it's going to be a complete pain in the ass however there's a very good probability that ship will be destroyed by the time it needs that maintenance so it's not a problem anyway and in that time you can produce a replacement if not many times more than its replacement. So it does actually make sense logistically for the Cardassians who are in this kind of situation where they are technologically behind. They have to fight in a very attritional way. And these kind of mononacelle turbojets, they allow them to consistently punch above their weight and field these large fleets seemingly out of nowhere. And also I think it makes the Cardassians from an out-of-universe perspective here for a second, it makes them very unique 
it's it's something that only they have a claim to only they really do this you know and i'm not sure if that's a a good thing or a bad thing but <laughs> it certainly uh it certainly helps develop their character and give them you know a unique as i say claim to fame uh but what do you think let me know in the comments below uh, do you have other thoughts about how Cardassian ships move and operate and how their engines work? Do you like this idea for a sort of warp turbojet? And uh, are there any other alien ships which have unusual designs which you'd like me to explain? Let me know in the comments below and I will see you all in the next video.